it is time for the weekly Q&A. So what I do in this video is I go through the previous week's videos and I compile a list of questions that have come up in the comments section. And what I do is I sit here and I answer them in one spot. So what I do is I pick the most thought-provoking questions or questions that I think people will really like to hear some answers to. And that way I can just put them all in one video so that people can just know what to expect on a weekly basis when I answer these questions. It's also to encourage you to ask questions or think outside the box. So whenever I post videos, comment, ask questions. And sometimes I won't just ask to have questions out here, I'll actually do comments. If people have nice comments or interesting stories, I'll include them as well. So let's go ahead and dive right in to the first video. So this is from last week's video. So the first video was, does keto slow down or increase your metabolism? A very interesting video actually breaking down the true science of what happens with the ketogenic diet and your resting metabolic rate. If you have any question about it whatsoever, whether the ketogenic diet is slowing down your metabolism or not, you're going to want to check this video out, but also something really good to give over to your family that might be questioning your low carb lifestyle. So this first question comes from Markel Tora. That means one meal a day, every day, won't slow down our RMR as long as it's on a ketogenic diet, right? Because you mentioned that doing one meal a day on a daily basis could decrease the RMR, and thus we shouldn't do it too often. For instance, go back to 16-8 every other day. That's a good point. So I have talked about how when you intermittent fast every day or when you do OMAD diet every day, you do run the potential of slowing down your metabolism. But slowing down your metabolism and affecting your resting metabolic rate, although somewhat similar, also have two kind of different components. Resting metabolic rate takes into account the amount of calories that you burn at rest, whereas your overall metabolism is a little bit more about like how many calories you can consume without gaining weight. So there's kind of a little bit of a gray area, but I see your point. The point is, is that the ketogenic diet would definitely give you more flexibility with one meal a day. You're definitely right there. Uh, Ginnaro Scotti says, Thomas, why is there a lot of info going around about keto shutting down hormone levels in men over 45? Those making it very hard to lose the last remaining bit of stubborn body fat. What is the age correlation? What changes over 45? I don't know where that's coming from. I've heard a couple people talk about it and we've dug into it. There's nothing going on. Honestly, if anything, it helps the LH FSH levels and helps support healthy testosterone levels. So um, I think it just could be some fake news that's out there right now, to be completely honest. Uh, but I'll look into it more. Uh, Carrie Scorer says, isn't it different for women than men because of the hormone fluctuations? Yes, it is, but not too much. You see, women have to be a little bit more careful with their thyroid, cruciferous vegetables, things like that. Uh, also, any diet fluctuation in women is going to have a more dramatic effect than it would on men. Like just because there's so many different moving pieces for women that aren't there for men, we have to be concerned with estrogen, uh, estrogen, progesterone, thyroid, other things that we don't have to be as concerned with with men. So yeah, you just want to be cognizant of that. In fact, I have a video coming out specifically on keto for women, so that might be a good one for you. Um, You're right, but says. Hi TDL, thanks for the great video. Question, what are the benefits slash drawbacks of a slow metabolism, so long as you don't overeat? I like the way that you put that. Honestly, there isn't a bad, bad side to a slow metabolism. If you're not overeating, a slower metabolism means less metabolic stress in your body. It's kind of like I've said before, like it actually is a survival of the fittest thing. If you have a slower metabolism, it means that you can get by with less. I think that's a good thing. So yeah, good question. Next video was your thyroid on keto and intermittent fasting. Common question that comes up is, am I destroying my thyroid by going on the keto diet? Well, I answered that question fully in depth, so make sure you check out that video after you watch this Q&A. Uh, Christian Trevino says, hi Thomas, what if you don't have a thyroid but you supplement with synthetic thyroid hormone? Christian, uh, then it's not gonna matter because you're at natural homeostasis all the time. So you're artificially or exogenously setting your thyroid level, so you're fine because it's just gonna be whatever medication you take. Uh, you may wanna talk to your doctor about getting off synth uh, synthetic and see if there's a natural replacement, but again, it all comes down to your relationship with your doctor. Uh, Alex Smith says, uh, why pecans and macadamia nuts are so addictive? <laughs> I think it's just because they taste good, man. I don't know if there's any addictive components to them. I just had to include that because I agree. They are addictive. Uh, Sarah Modiri says, um, I've read a lot about goitrogen vegetables having a negative effect on the thyroid, yet many of them have so many nutrients. Many great keto carb substitutes like cauliflower rice and broccoli are made of them, and I find myself eating these vegetables often. Do you think that I should, it should be an actual concern if I'm hypothyroid? I always cook them, and I know that's supposed to be better, but I wasn't sure how back this concept is. Another topic I was wondering are nightshades. Well, let's just go ahead and talk, I'm just gonna talk about the cruciferous, the goitrous vegetables. As long as you're eating them in moderation, you're okay, honestly. And usually it has to be raw that's gonna end up causing an issue, so you're gonna be fine, honestly. The ketogenic diet adds a layer of protection from that too, so people think it's the opposite, but generally speaking, unless you have a specific reason or possibly even Graves' disease where it's hyperactive, not a whole thing, a whole lot of stuff to worry about there. Uh, Kit Wilson says, 
how it affects Graves' disease. Okay, so the ketogenic diet can affect Graves' disease in a positive way because it actually can lower the amount of the available T3, or not the available, but the active T3, while still keeping your T4 stabilized. Just the reduction of carbs alone ends up reducing thyroid simply because glucose takes thyroid hormone to metabolize. So without that, your thyroid hormone can reduce. So it actually could work out great for you. Next video was, does your blood sugar matter on keto and fasting? Okay, the reason I said this is because people tend to think that blood sugar goes to zero when you're on keto. Like, no, it doesn't. Your blood sugar still stays you know, at its normal range. It just might come down a little bit. So anyway, this was all about the blood sugar mattering. So Roseanne Dietschy says, uh, Thomas, would you suggest measuring your A1C rather than daily glucose, or will the results be similar? Always measure your A1C, but you definitely want to look at your daily glucose too, because that tells you are where you are at that point in time. TK421PSS says, Thomas, thanks for the video as always. I know it's relative, but what numbers would you consider being a large blood sugar spike from normal around mid-90s? Um, honestly, I think anything over 95 is a pretty good spike, but I tend to spike over 100, 110 when I'm on keto if I eat the wrong thing. So again, it is all relative, so it's really hard to answer that. Next question, Ryan Blazer says, uh, so what about the GKI, glucose ketone index? Okay, all I'm gonna say is that I posted a video on that. And so at the time of this recording, it's literally going out today. So you wanna check back on my channel and look for the video that talks about how to measure your overall fat loss on keto, and that's the GKI video. A uh, little voice says, high blood sugar causes damage to blood vessels and neurons, which is why people with diabetes end up with nerve damage. But what is the impact of high insulin? Is it also damaging? Well, high insulin definitely makes it so you can't lose weight. High levels of insulin make it so you don't have high levels of glucagon, which actually allow AMPK, which is what allows different substrates to be used for energy. So you basically never be able to lose weight. So uh, chronically high levels of insulin are not a good thing. Okay, then we've got the next video, how to build muscle with fasting, the ultimate guide. This was a cool twist. This was how I, I wanted to put something together that showed how you can strategically lay out your day to do the ketogen or do the fasting diet while still being able to build muscle. Because honestly, there was a specific approach. So go check that video out. But the first question comes from Christy O'Quinn. I break my 18 hour fast four hours after a workout. Is four hours after a workout too long? Yes, you should be breaking your fast immediately after your workout in that case. A uh, little voice says, would this mechanism be the same if underweight? For example, if clinically underweight due to sarcopenia but now restoring health, would it be beneficial to add extra protein in this case when not fasting? Yeah, it definitely would. It could help you out. Uh, Meisterling says, shouldn't I wait for an hour or two after workout before eating? Or is this only if I want to burn more fat and not build more muscle? Great question. Correct. If you want to burn more fat, you want to ride the wave. You'll continue to burn fat and burn some calories up after the workout. But if you're trying to build muscle, you want to get it right when your insulin sensitivity is high. So I'd say within 60 minutes. Ashley Dawson says, is there anything you can do to ensure that performance in the gym doesn't suffer while you're fasting? For me, there's a big drop off, especially if I start feeling hunger pains while working out. Okay, you got to remember that it's all relative. Okay, it's all about your body's adaptation to stress. If your workout is harder, then it's relative. You're still having a hard workout that's getting you the desired stress adaptation outcome. So then when you do eat and you work out when you do eat, you'll be exponentially stronger. So it's all relative. It's like, what are you after? Are you after, like you have to compare apples to apples, like strength when you're fasted, strength when you're fed, okay? Endurance when you're fasted, endurance when you're fed. You can't compare them to each other because they're two different worlds. But if you progressively get yourself stronger in the gym in a fasted period, you can see probably a linear increase in your strength in a fed state in the gym if you were to progress it or to measure it apples to apples. So if you went one week uh, in the gym fasted training and measured your results, and then you went one week in the gym fed training and measured your results, you'd probably see a linear increase, be pretty parallel. So anyway, I hope this helps everyone out. If you have ideas for future videos, put them in the comment section. I think this is a great time to see ideas for future videos. So I'd love to see those down in the comment section. And as always, make sure you're locked in on my channel. I'll see you soon.